Good morning and welcome to Rising. We've got another great show for you today. Let's get right into it. It's been more than five months since the terrorist attacks by Hamas into Israel and the military incursion into Gaza. Since then, at least 95 journalists have been killed in the region, 90 of whom are Palestinian, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, which has been tracking the mounting toll. CPJ says it is the deadliest conflict for journalists since it started collecting data in 1992. This staggering figure has not been lost in the world's media. Mm. Meanwhile, CNN reported Wednesday that Palestinian journalists and health workers were blindfolded and stripped down to their underwear at Al-Shiva Hospital in northern Gaza. The reports say they were left outside, undressed in the cold. The IDF claimed senior Hamas terrorists were using the hospital. 7,000 patients and displaced people were housed in the hospital prior to the attack, according to the Gaza government. One Al Jazeera journalist told CNN that he and his team were blindfolded and handcuffed for 12 hours. Al Jazeera headquarters said they were beaten. When they were finally released, CNN reports the IDF kept their phones and their ID. A Biden State Department spokesperson was asked about America's tepid response to the detention of his colleague and the unprecedented attack on journalists. Let's hear what the State Department had to say in response. When will the United States demand and say that this cannot keep on going with journalists that are credentialed, that have worked there for year after year, decade after decade, well known to the Israelis, well known to the Israelis. Why do they keep taking them, targeting them, killing them? imprisoning them with impunity. Why is that not outrageous to you? Said, when we uh, talk about continuing to press Israel to enhance its mechanisms to better protect civilians, we of course are also talking about uh, extending that to journalists as well. We are always uh, concerned for the safety of journalists, especially in conflict zones, especially in somewhere like Gaza, where journalism plays a critical role. And as Secretary Blinken has said, journalists, including many Palestinians in Gaza, um, are doing extraordinary work under the most dangerous conditions, and we've been unequivocal here. Uh, we also have been uh, clear and reiterated the fact that um, Israel needs to abide by uh, international humanitarian law, especially uh, I I as it conducts these operations, and that's something we'll continue uh, to reiterate with them. And there was a follow-up question from that journalist. Let's take a listen. Honestly, with that, you know, this slap on the rest kind of language is not going in any way, shape, or form to sway the Israelis or to pressure them or to make them do so. You should, you know, I mean, if everybody believes that a civilized country like the United States of America, who is basically the umbilical cord for Israel to do everything under the sun, can stand and say, this should not go on. We, this should not go on. Not just, you know, we urge them not to harm them and so on. Because this is obviously a systematic. I mean, when you, when, uh, 150, uh, I don't know how many, 150 journalists are killed and Said, imprisoned and taken and so on. This is not just, you know, it doesn't, something that It doesn't happened. sound like you have a follow-up question. So let me just jump in and say, from the president on down, um, we have reiterated that Israel needs to, it has a moral and strategic imperative uh, to do more and to do everything it can to work on and bolster its deconfliction mechanisms to uh, take additional steps to protect civilians and minimize civilian casualties. And that, of course, includes and extends to journalists who we believe are doing important and vital work um, in the region. All right. That was a pretty extraordinary exchange. I was really appreciative that the journalist there, uh, Sayed Erekat, was able to get that follow-up in because the initial response is so much of what we've heard from the government for months now, which is that of course, uh, Israel has an obligation to uphold humanitarian law. It has an obligation to protect journalists. Of course, we agree that journalists shouldn't be targeted and should be protected. But that says absolutely nothing about whether or not they are, in fact, uh, living up to those expectations, in fact, protecting journalists, in fact, um, uh, following humanitarian law, and whether or not the United States is ever willing to use its leverage to force Israel to comply. The answer to that question seems to be no. Yeah. There's a lot of poo-pooing and hand-wringing, but there's no action taken. Um, one is, I think, forced to conclude that the U.S. government does not particularly care or is not or doesn't care enough 
to demand that different actions be taken, in which case they should just be honest with the American people that we support Israel and they can do whatever they want and we're going to continue supporting and funding them regardless of what they do, which would be the honest answer to give. Yeah, I mean, that's the implicit answer and I do think that's why you're seeing in polls a real nosedive in public opinion about uh, Joe Biden and his handling of this. I mean, there's a certain amount I think the public can ignore. But when you're at a point where you have journalists, this is a, a journalist saying that my colleague, this is not, you know, an allegation. This is saying I, my colleague is pictured having been stripped down out of his clothes and bound like a suspect, someone who is a journalist, who presenting as a journalist, who is wearing the um, uh, insignia of a journalist in the field, about uh, someone about whom there's no confusion, who is being treated like a criminal and a suspect for the alleged crime, the, the, the seeming crime of simply covering a war zone and the kinds of abuses that Palestinians in Gaza have said they've been subject to for months now. And you get this, this response um, from Patel there, like, oh, uh, I don't think I'm going to get a fo an actual follow-up question from you, so yada, yada, yada. I mean, at this point, we're, we're living in a country where we, we put the freedom of the press as our, and our freedom of speech as the First Amendment. We have entire political movements that are really rallying around the idea that one party or the other is being indifferent to those interests. We have enormous investment, rightly so, in exposés like the Twitter files. And yet here our own government spokesperson is saying that, is, is um, conveying, I should say, an, an absolutely blasé attitude to a journalist being stripped down naked Look, and taken into custody and not having their ID returned by someone who was described repeatedly as the only democracy in the region and our closest ally in the region. That, it's, it's remarkable to me that that's not front page news. I mean, I don't think, I wanna be careful here, I don't think journalists don't deserve special and extra rights versus other people just by virtue of saying they're journalists. Um, I, frankly, I'm, I think one should one should not necessarily be appalled just because this person is a journalist, but because people who are not terrorists or suspected of terrorism should be not shouldn't be treated like this regardless of their profession or vocation. If they have some suspicion of these, if they're being detained for some reason, they should say what the you know it's under suspicion. They're not like immune from suspicion because they're journalists. Why would there be suspicion? Did you hear any articulation of why this journalist would be suspicious in the least? No, I did not. That's what I'm saying. It, but it's not, it's not. Right. So they, for one. Let me finish. It's not unjust because the person is a journalist. It's unjust to hold people or detain people or strip them. Yes, it unless, is. Unless you are but charging them or under suspicion of some crime. It's not because he's a journalist. No, but it's, it's also. a human being. But you're also wrong about that. Journalists do get pr special protection in war zones. They are immune from attacks unless they're demonstrated to be participating in the war. And these journalists, there's been no allegation, you did not hear from Patel there, and you have not heard from the IDF, that there's any allegation that this Al-Quds journalist or the Al, Al Jazeera journalists that were subject to being stripped down and treated as criminals by the Israeli government were at all participating in the October 7th attack. So I think as a journalist, the community at large should be infuriated by this. And you, and you see in the back and forth when you watch the totality of that press conference, that the journalists in the room, I think, were really taken aback by the, um, again, blasé attitude that the State Department has taken to this issue. And I would say, like, we cover a lot of First Amendment issues on, on this show. There is a lot of interest, I think, in whether the government is overreaching, particularly on the right side of the aisle when it comes to the internet. There is, I think, very rightly so, a lot of investment in whether or not the um, the effort to ban TikTok is part of a broader censorship campaign. And I would just include the behavior of our allies in the U.S. support of that behavior and failure to use its leverage to end that behavior um, as part and parcel of what does feel like to be a diminishment in the respect for and the value of something that's supposed to be one of our most cherished amendments here at home. Meanwhile, U.S. top diplomat Antony Blinken is in Egypt pushing for a ceasefire. Even while Israel stands firm in its threats to invade Rafah, Blinken called for an immediate ceasefire in exchange for the hostages. The U.S. said it has also submitted a draft resolution to the U.N. Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire. It had vetoed three previous resolutions calling for just that. So is this a positive development? Yeah, this is really interesting. This is getting framed as Blinken's forcefully calling for a ceasefire. He's aggressively wanting a ceasefire. But the details are really thin on this. And remember, 
The America at the UN has already vetoed a ceasefire agreement twice, and the sticking points do seem to be, and what is not clear right now about what is on the table from Blinken's perspective, from the U.S. perspective, is whether or not the ceasefire is permanent. That has been the key sticking point for a very long time. Is this a simply pause, a six-week pause, which is what um, uh, Joe Biden has been calling a ceasefire for the last couple of weeks now, a pause the likes of which doesn't do a lot for the people of Gaza when there has been a, cause, a pause before. Obviously, there was a pause around the time of the holidays, and then how many tens of thousands of people have been killed, how many uh, buildings, homes have been destroyed, how many people have displaced, been displaced since then. A brief pause in the violence is not much of a um, relief to people, especially now that we're also contending with. Uh, massive famine in the region. So is this actually a permanent ceasefire and an end to the conflict in a permanent way, or is this another one of these attempts to simply have a little bit of a break from the carnage and then continuing on as usual? And I do think that it is, a, it's bizarre for the State Department to be claiming to be pushing hard for a ceasefire at the UN after it has been very clearly on record blocking two ceasefire deals at the UN. Yeah. Indeed. I think the political calculation is changing for the Biden administration on the domestic front, and that's probably where the change of attitude comes yeah. from. Yeah. This whole thing, frankly, feels like a messaging spectacle in the same way that adopting the term ceasefire a couple of weeks ago also felt like a messaging, messaging shift without a substantive shift. But we will definitely keep you up to date if there's any more details on what Blinken's new ceasefire plan actually entails. Do stick around. We have more rising for you right after this.